Hello all. Uh, thank you for coming back to F. True Crime. We are really thrilled to have you all with us. Make sure if you want updates, go over to our social media pages on Insta, Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook, especially Facebook. Facebook is the page where I feel I can interact a lot easier with people. So head on over there if you want to know what's coming up on the podcast or vlog. And general chit chat. Always feel free to post something in there because we would love to hear recommendations of crimes and anything you would like us to dig into further. Also, we will be setting up a merch store for mugs, t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. But we will also be putting up some giveaways. Now, because of COVID and there being another 700 cases here in Melbourne overnight, we will be limiting how these packages are handled. So when someone does win a giveaway, they will be sent straight from the merchant to the recipient because we do not want to place any of you at risk. Not now. It is just... It's a crazy time in this world, especially where we live. Now we're in mandatory masks. We're now, we can only leave the house for four reasons. So it's getting a little bit crazy, um, but it's what we need to do to try and curb this. Okay. So let's get to today's case. On the night of February 3rd, 2018, Alyssa Noceda 18, a former student from Mariner High School had gone to a party at a Lake Martha Lake mobile home in the 400 block of Lakewood Road and that is where she met Brian Valera, the man that would rape her as she died. At one stage it sounded like necrophilia but we will get further into that. Brian met Alyssa through a mutual friend and they began speaking online, getting to know one another. Alyssa had just recently broken up with her boyfriend, so she thought it would be a good idea to attend a party-like situation over at Brian's house on the Saturday night. But while at this party, Alyssa began having a little bit too much fun and she went on to snort what Brian called a fat line of Percocet. According to Brian, she seemed really out of it. And while Brian was having sex with her, he later told police that she tilted her head to the side and her eyes rolled into the back of her head. And he actually sat there and did this for the investigators. He disgustingly made those motions to show the investigators what he was talking about. According to Brian, Alyssa collapsed within minutes of taking the drugs. After she had collapsed, he then took the time to search the internet and he typed in what to do if someone overdoses on perks. Of course, Google told him to immediately contact 911. He did not do that. Instead, he took photos of Alyssa's almost naked body and he sent those photos off to his friends in a texting group. One friend who's 18 asked for a video. When it was sent to this unknown recipient, that friend sent back, bro, you killed her. Brian went on to tell him that she died having sex with me. She was on her back, her lips swollen, purple and blue. Brian then wrote, but not joking, she OD'd bruh. He then added that he didn't care because he was sexually assaulting her to pass the time. His exact words, I'm smashing her to pass the time. After Brian raped Alyssa again, he noticed she might still be breathing. So he considered taking her to the hospital. What a great guy. Not. Then he told his friends that he was too tired to do so. But, of course, he didn't. 
Instead, he played video games before falling asleep. On that Sunday, the day after the OD, Brian showed Alyssa's body to his housemate, who then told him to call 911. That is according to the housemate's story given to detectives. But again, Brian chose not to. He then used her dead thumb to unlock her phone and he made a post on Snapchat on her behalf saying, I'm out, bye, to imply that Alyssa had run away so that no one would come to him looking. But this guy, he ain't no genius, let me tell you, and you'll see why in a minute. Now, Alyssa had died sometime, according to coroner, sometime between that Saturday night and the following morning. But Brian admitted to a friend that he wasn't sure whether Alyssa was alive or dead while he was having sex with her. So, does that make him a necrophilia? I guess it does. Not, I don't know if he was going out of his way to have that title, but I'm, it does. That's disgusting. He's a vile human being, people. Brian claimed that Alyssa had snored throughout the night. But then he later realized she was choking on her saliva. I'm wondering if she was choking on saliva or if she had that death rattle that people get just before they die. It's kind of like a phlegm sound. I am very aware of this sound. I have been with many people that have passed away. We have a lot of illness in our family. Um, so I'm guessing that, yeah, it could have been death rattle that he was hearing. But even with the death rattle, he should have done something. Ryan's roommate later reported to sheriff's deputies that he saw the young woman alive at 9pm on the Saturday. He then said that Sunday morning, Brian stepped out of his room and said he needed help. And that was when Brian showed the roommate Alyssa's dead body. The roommate once again told Brian he needed to call police. Instead, Brian went to work and he worked a double shift at Dairy Queen. When he arrived, he saw that there was construction going on behind his work, behind the Dairy Queen. And that was where he decided to throw Alyssa's phone. While he went to work, he left Alyssa's dead body on his bed, but he did make sure to lock the bedroom door. Brian had recently been kicked out of his home by his mother and according to his mother Brian lived a gangster lifestyle and he was an ex-gang member but you wouldn't think of it to see him he just looks like an absolute wimp if you ask me after being kicked out of home Brian went to live at the mobile home where he paid for his accommodation out of the money he gained by dealing drugs on money that he gained on top of his Dairy Queen job. According to Brian's statements, he went home after his shift and he tried to remove his DNA from Alyssa's body. He even went online to do research about how to remove DNA. All of these people learn you never ever ever leave a digital trail. My goodness. Eventually he grabbed a crate from his mother's house down the street and he washed Alyssa's body down but he did confess that he had to break Alyssa's legs to be able to fit her in this plastic crate. Now because he's such a brilliant genius while he was at work at the Dairy Queen he told a co-worker about these grisly details of what had taken place the evening before. He even told the co-worker about his plan on getting rid of the body. He told him he had found a spot in Marysville where he planned to bury her. I'd spark here. Curious as to if he was telling the truth, the co-worker then spoke to his girlfriend and gave her the name and any details he knew about this girl. Now the girlfriend, this is after his shift, the girlfriend went on Facebook and she actually found a post from Alyssa's mother who had put up a missing poster on the social media platforms. Then he took a look at the girl and he recognized her and she had the same name of 
who Brian was describing to him while at work that day. Shortly after his realization, the co-worker called police and within no time at all, officers immediately surrounded the mobile home and they forced entry to arrest Brian. It wasn't until two hours later that they recovered Alyssa's body from the mobile home. The crate was left in Brian's bedroom. After recovering the body on February 6th, Brian was charged with rape, manslaughter and homicide by controlled substance. When questioned by police, the 19-year-old suspect at the time admitted to having sex with the girl but insisted that even though she was out of it, the encounter was consensual. He even went on to admit the rest of his wrongdoings. Someone got a conscience, boys and girls. He later appeared before the district court dressed in a prison uniform. Deputy Prosecutor Bob Hendricks said the allegations against Brian showed callous and shocking disregard for human life. Judge Tam Bowie returned Brian to custody and said his bail at a half a million dollars. And he was told he would again appear before court for a later hearing. At the trial, while in court, Alyssa's mother, Gina, could be heard muttering that she was disgusted in having to even look at the defendant, as you would be as a mother. Later, Alyssa's mother, Gina, spoke about her daughter. She said she was an innocent 18-year-old girl having fun and she was taken advantage of. I want to know why. She didn't deserve it. Nobody deserves anything that bad. Now, in a complete slap in the face, Brian was only sentenced to 34 months in prison after pleading guilty to manslaughter and unlawful disposal of remains. It was a miscarriage of justice in my opinion. But of course, as all scumbags do, he had a plea agreement put in place. The sad part in all of this is that the judge stated that auto theft cases have more serious penalties than what he had been given. She noted that she was bound by state law to keep the punishment to 34 months, the maximum allowed under the circumstances for someone without a criminal record. How did he not have a criminal record? The guy was a drug dealer. I'm not sure the legislator really contemplated something like this. A seemingly lenient sentence for a violent crime such as rape is not unheard of. Punishments are typically a life lesson. And as a result of a plea agreement or lack of criminal history, in Brian's case, his plea deal lowered the manslaughter charge to a second degree felony and the rape charge to a third degree felony, all because he didn't have any priors. While standing next to his lawyer during his sentencing, wearing a green and white striped prison garb, Brian went on to apologize for his foolish actions. That's what he told the judge. Sitting right behind him were Alyssa's friends and family, many of whom were wearing black t-shirts with Alyssa's picture on them and angel wings beside them. Gina, the mother, called the punishment a joke. She also told reporters that they will plan on challenging the state's sentencing laws. So they bloody should. I can't get over how ridiculous this case is and I can't get over how it ended. When making these laws, they should think of every single scenario possible because there are some sick 
sick bastards out there. There are sick guys and they need to take absolutely everything into account. Make sure you join us tomorrow. I'll be covering the Cherry Periwinkle case. It's taken a few days to gather the information and gather. I knew about it. How could you not? But it's taken a little while to get everything together because there was a lot of information out there and there's a lot of background on that mother. We may need to do it over a couple of days because it's going to take forever. This girl was brutalized, eight years old and brutalized. She deserves to continue to have a voice. It happened in 2013, but it's still a case that really holds me. I don't know if it's because I'm a mum. I don't know if it's because I am sick to death of seeing this stuff happen to kids, but it's a case that has always stuck with me. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button and that little ding button and you will never ever miss any content coming from us. But for today, I am going to go and continue working on this case. This mother, my goodness, I should do a whole segment just on Rain Periwinkle. There's a lot out there. But there's also the trial that you can watch. I mean, you can wait for us to um, put it all together for you. But there are hours and hours of trial footage on YouTube that you can go through if you are interested. That's what's taken so long to get things together is I like to watch the entire trial if I can get a hold of it so that I can outline anything that shakes me up a bit and go oh wow why did that happen what did they do that for so make sure you join us and i will be back tomorrow thank you everybody for joining us we'll see you soon